Young people have more much in jury in final part of this competition. When you see is a location of injuries, you see near to same situation. Most of injuries you have for lower extremity. So, and uh, is this big problem and the coach must thinking about this in training process for preparing. But same you can see that more much injuries for lower extremity have more young people, a, uh, 18 and more young. So in this process we understand is not enough preparing, physical preparing, technical preparing, and again is need to thinking about this in training process. When, when we see which uh, diagnosis of injuries of handball players, uh, 18 years old, same as for 20 after you see the most, uh, most injuries, you have contusion. Is, uh, because in this game situation is most of all you see this, and in second place you have sprains. For players for 20 years old, situation is same, but uh, contusions is same. For example, you have 18 and sprain 8. Same conception for two age players, but just only for full these numbers. If you see, uh, analyze game position, which most of all have injuries, you can see is uh, people from play in back position. And uh, in competition for 18 years plays, players, we see the most uh, injuries have people center back. Because more must move, more movies, more must attack, must fight against opponents. And this position is uh, more dangerous for these players. And second place, you have left back. So we surprised, but goalkeeper have not too much injuries in this, in this research, but uh, only for these players. And sometimes, for example, for girls we analyzed, little bit more much injuries have pivot players, but for boys only people for back lines. Just after we analyzed in which time for match, people have injuries. Same, we a little bit surprised because, for example, for people, players 18 years old, the most injuries you have at the end of first part of time, first part of game, and after resting time, you see again same, uh, same injuries, and most of all you have in the middle second part of game. Little bit another picture you see for players for 20 years old. You see the most injuries after resting time. We be big surprise. So for coach is need to understand again for after for, uh, finish time for resting is need again to prepare players to go inside game. It's very important because after you see m much injuries of this tournament you have in, in second part of the game at the start and the middle. Uh, of course, uh, most of all injuries you have in conditions of contact, contact against opponent. And you see demonstrating picture and many pictures before, you can see same situation and understand for what we have injuries. Most of all, you have for landing, for one step, for one foot after jumping, for stop before direction, or when make fint, in only in this position. So, conclusions. The main injuries to handball players, of course, pro, uh, we see in contact during, after throwing and passing the ball and jump and suggest, sudden stop and change of direction. And uh, for players for 17 years old, of course, we understand from this research need to more much prepare. For this competition, some people not very ready for physical and technical conditions. And is necessary in the training process to pay close attention for technique on performance techniques and motor action by athletes. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Have questions? Yes. Of course. Yes, yes. And 
Yes, is this problem, but uh, I think in this uh, idea for thinking about time of tournament, yes, maybe, because I know many sportsmen in this time have a long time for resting, for re recovery time, yes. So some, some, um, some national teams have preparing time in special training camp, yes, but sometimes it's not enough, yes, I'm sure. And uh, same uh, when I was working in a medical commission in IGF, same we discuss about this. And, sp and now uh, competition commission, arbit arbitrage commission thinking about time for resting time. Maybe it's more short, maybe directly change because you see it's resting and after again you have injury. But just idea, but, it's cho but this is question for future. Yes, 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 it is official, this is official dates because uh, we work with uh, reports of official reports in this competition from uh, official people from uh, teams, yes, and fixed which time he have injury. Is this, for what is very interesting moment, not is from warm, warm up before game, we, maybe it's okay, but after, because is now is more big question when people have injury. Sometimes because people play, it's okay, it's, it's difficult, difficult to understand. But when people sit and after go for change new, another, another player, start and after a little bit don't move and of course you can jury very quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now we, when we finish analyze for peop, for every championship for adult people, adult players, for national teams, just see we start to is uh, with research again restart federation for see conception. What do we have in future? Because for invite new people, we must uh, show to everybody handball is not dangerous. For what change rules, uh, make some conditions for people more comfortable situation, everything, equipment uh, is possible to use. So it's future and we must make everything, of course, be in training process for minimize, minimized injury in uh, competition. Thank you. Yeah, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Sabrina Etri from Heidelberg. I'm a sports scientist and I'm doing research in ACL injury prevention. So I'm interested in how can I change biomechanics through specific training. And today I'll talk about that in elite female handball players. Now what's the background? We've got approximately 250,000 ACL injuries per year in the States with a relatively well investigated injury mechanism concerning or regarding the knee, which is excessive knee valgus in combination with internal or external rotation and or low knee flexion during deceleration, change of direction and landing after a jump. So interestingly, 70% of these injuries happen non-contact and critical is pressure. Most of the time the athletes are having the ball or handling the ball or just pass the ball and fatigue. We just saw that nice graph showing in the second half there are more injuries. And females do have a distinct higher risk to rupture their ACL than males. Now what's the background? We do have very good neuromuscular training programs. They can reduce the relative risk up to 73%. We even heard higher rates yesterday. 
um, but still injury rates stay high, they even rise, we heard that yesterday as well. So I think, first of all, we have to think about our testings. Do they reflect like the actual risk situation? And then we have to better understand the single components of the programs, which is they are mostly agility, plurimetric, strength, balance, training, stabil stabilizing things, to actually put them together in a perfect way to get the maximal protective effect out of it. And we have to guarantee implementation. Because we heard that the trainers have to be willing to sacri sacrifice time for the exercises. And it should be a bit fun for the athletes. So that's where my concrete research question starts. I wanted to look at the effects of a six week, very progressive sports specific sensory motor training, which I will refer to as coordination training, versus a machine based hypertrophy training. Because I wanted to exclude that strength part. Um, the effect on the kinematics, on the kinetics, and EMG of elite female handball players in sport-specific risk situations. Um, to think outside the box, I had a sub-hypothesis sub looking at biomechanics and kinesophobia. We know that from um, ACL reconstructed patients going back to sports, return to sports, but it's pretty new in prevention. So I thought that athletes, maybe athletes with more kinesophobia, fear, would show worse biomechanics, like worse kinematics, meaning lower knee flexion, more valgars, um, more internal rotation. So to answer my research questions, I did an intervention study with the third German handball league. They had a pre and a post test. They had six weeks training, three times per work week, 50 minutes. And they were assigned via match randomization into the hypertrophy training group and the coordination training group. I lost one from the coordination training group due to a partial ACL tear. <laughs> It was not in my training. I was actually pretty angry with the trainer. I think she was very tired, and then it just happened. In addition to that, I did a reliability study, because I have a new test. Uh, and the sports students, they showed a very high activity level to match with the elite temple players. They had pre- and post-testing within three weeks without any intervention. So the data collection encompassed clinical knee examination to make sure that the outcome wouldn't be according to a clinical instable knee or very stable knee, but part of the training. Um, we had questionnaires uh, with self-reported knee function, with activity level, with kinesophobia. We also included isokinetic testing and postural control. And the heart of the work was um, to record kinematics and kinetics and EMG during sport-specific movements. So we used a 12-camera Viking system for that to force plates and 16-channel EMG system. The first test was the bilateral drop jump, that's well known. We uh, had it without arm swing and we used a 30-centimeter box. And according to work from Hewitt and Meyer, we placed the toe markers 35 centimeters apart because you can provoke a little bit more valgus. And the centerpiece of the study was that modified Heidelberg jumping coordination test. After modifying that test, we had a test which included time pressure. They had to start on a signal as fast as they could. Um, ball handling, we had an overhead goal, bowl, we had the landing on one leg and the unanticipated change of direction or unanticipated stabilizing on a single leg if there was no light on. So just to give you an idea about the training, everybody knows machine-based hypertrophy training. That is my coordination training, it has three phases, but they're not one after another. You will always find like really active exercises in, in phase one as well. So it's pretty much get to know knee alignment, it's transfer to sport-specific movements, and then we have to retrieve it and help with specific risk situations. There's a lot of fatigue, there's motor learning, there's uh, ball action. Um, and always disturbing the athletes. All the exercises are done without shoes to have a good sensory input over their foot sole. Okay, the results. So the job show, showed mostly good to excellent results. The Heidelberg coordination jumping test um, showed very variable results, but striking was the unanticipated single leg landings for the non-dominant side, 
which showed excellent reliability in all three planes. Um, we found for the intervention study, we found various proposed changes, significant changes. I'm happy to discuss them later. But it, we only found three changes with group effects, and they were all for kinematic variables for the non-dominant side, and two of them affected the unanticipated single leg landings. And since they showed excellent reliability, I'm going to refer to them now. So these are the time series curves of the single leg landings in all three planes. Um, the blue, you would expect the blue line in sagittal plane to be higher for the post test because that means that the athlete lands with more knee flexion. We see that for the coordination group. We don't see it in the strength group at all. There was no change. You would expect in frontal plane also that the blue line comes up because that means they have less vulgars. We see that again in the coordination group, but not in the strength group. And in transverse plane, you would expect the uh, blue line to come down so that they show less internal rotation. We found the two group effects for the range of motion in transverse plane for the coordination group and uh, for peak vulgus for the strength group. So if we look at the data a little bit more precise, we can see that the coordination group improved their rotational stability they actually re reduce their internal external range of motion by 5.5 degrees with a high um, effect size compared to the strength group. And the ANCOVA says that 49% is due to the specific training. And if we look at single case analysis, which is inevitable if I have such a small sample size, the results support um, the group effects. So if you look at peak vulgus, we can see that the strength group actually worsened their peak vulgus by almost four degrees with a very strong effect compared to the coordination group where nothing big happened. Again, the statistics say that more than 40% is attributed to the specific training. And again, oops, sorry. And again, the single case analysis supports these findings. Results for biomechanics and field movements I showed a significant moderate negative correlation between peak vulgus and more kinesiophobia of the non-dominant side. So meaning players with more fear, they showed more or worse peak vulgus angles on their non-dominant side. Interestingly, I had one player, she ruptured her ACL seven months after the intervention. They didn't keep on doing the exercises. And she was in the coordination group and I had, like she stuck into my eyes the whole time because she's, she was very stiff, she didn't bend her knee. I always told her to be a little bit more dynamic. So she was, you, on the right side, you see the score from the kinesiophobia. And there were three, having three players with a high score and she was one of the three players. And she actually did rapture her ACL on the non-dominant side. So that's just a single case analysis, but I think it's pretty interesting. Um, discussion. Well, I think the Heidelberg jumping coordination test and his modified version can actually reproduce the complex risk situation. It does suit for biomechanical pre and post analysis. We had reliable results. Maybe it's even, um, it can even like identify high risk athletes because the risk athlete who ruptured her ACL later, she did show different kinematics, different kinetics, different EMG. So for sure, one had, this should be like verified with a larger sample size. Um, the sport-specific sensory motor training did obviously have an effect which was a movement modification in favor of injury prevention. Um, they showed a better rotational stability for this unanticipated single leg landings after the intervention. And Voitis and Collex uh, could prove in 2016 that not only a maximal loading to the ACL can be dangerous, but also repetitive sub-maximal loadings can actually weaken the, um, the ACL so that it can rupture due to a tissue failure. The hypertrophy training, they worsened the vulgus, so uh, without functional input, hypertrophy training should be considered critical because we don't know if the strength transfer is guaranteed in all three planes. And here it could prove that vulgus is a predictor for a higher risk of um, ACL, ACL injury. 
I know there's a big study which could not show the same, but they did not have the same protocol. They did not place the feet 35 centimeters apart. That's a very important thing. So fear of movement, I think these questionnaires, they should be used much more often in practical um, settings and research because they might have the potential to actually identify high-risk athletes without um, expensive equipment. This is for sure a pilot study. It does have limitations, as you can see on the slide. First of all, the small sample size. But I actually do think that the small sample size is also a big strength, because every athlete was controlled really well, and they were not allowed to do any other uh, training except the intervention training. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I do the test barefoot because I don't want any difference because of the shoe and I do the training barefoot because of the sensory input so to transfer it to the actual game I have no idea but the shoe just stabilizes the foot so I want to take that one that part out of it out of the training <laughs> yeah actually the training I still do it and um, I've, I've changed some things because the coordination group, for example, uh, the strength group, for example, they could reduce the ground reaction forces. No group effect, that's why not, I didn't talk about it. Like as I said, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later. But so I change it a bit and I uh, work much more also with the hard ground and to really absorb forces, but still with disturbing the athlete all the time. I think it's a great thing. The athletes like it and the trainers like it because they're always handling with the ball. And we heard that great presentation yesterday where they said, work with the ball. We always work with the ball. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on it. I, I have no idea yet. I'm like building up my, sam my own little lap. So right now I do work a lot still with the drop jump, but with these feet 35 centimeters apart, it's a big difference to a normal drop jump. Um, and I'm still working on that change of direction thing. I saw a cool test. Um, at the ISB in Calgary, where they just, they didn't have the ball and everything and signals, they just jumped down from a box and then had the cutting situation. So that might be easier to um, collect data in the actual court, because they do collect data in the court with the drop jump. So I think this change of direction from a box could be a possibility. Because coach's eye is, is cool. We've got cool apps to work on um, kinematics, or to work with. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That is actually my big strength, that I'm a sports scientist. I work in the court, and I work in the lab, and I work with the kids, and I work on the data, so, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> Thanks.
<laughs> okay, uh, good morning. Uh, we are starting the, the third presentation. Uh, for the ones who were here uh, yesterday, uh, we made already a presentation uh, very concrete concerning esports. Uh, me and Lars, we are bringing here a more wider um, presentation concerning technology, uh, how, uh, how are our ideas, how we started, why we are now at this point, and at the end uh, we will also show uh, some concrete examples what we are, we are doing, and it, it, it is an ongoing project. So this, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you all know this, uh, the first three lines, we took it from uh, the document from 2019, these are the, uh, the, the concrete data concerning sports and, uh, well, uh, as you know, sports always was very and is very important in Europe, it's something that we have in common. Uh, and. Uh, and also you know that football is the most popular sport, or is still the most popular sport uh, uh, in our continent. But other team sports like handball, basketball, ice hockey, volleyball, they are also uh, very uh, important, not only for the ones who are practicing, but also, of course, for, for, the, for the fans. For the European Handball uh, Federation, it was all, always very uh, important uh, that we could transfer knowledge, and uh, this is what we are doing here in these conferences, uh, in the different courses that since the beginning the European Handball Federation is doing, and of course all the national handball federations, so it's not very different in, uh, in the other countries, they also have this preoccupation. And finally, and this is maybe the most important for us, is the relation between these and uh, the, the education. And for us, it's important to put this together uh, because with this, we, uh, nowadays, we can have a different approach uh, concerning uh, teaching between the tutors, between the, the lecturers, and between the, uh, between the coaches, the referees, and, and the delegates. And one of these examples is uh, what we call inside the European Handball Federation is the visual education process because almost everything that we have, of course, we have nice documents, but the better, uh, the, well, uh, I would say the better documents that we have are the videos and uh, the different teaching uh, tools that we have uh, for all of the community. And again, I'm giving here the perspective from the European Handball Federation, but I'm, uh, I'm also working in my federation and I know from the different federations, uh, this is not very different. So most of the national federations in Europe are, are, are using uh, the uh, same system, sometimes with different tools, but uh, with the same approach and this is still present so uh, you also all know this it's a print screen concerning the e-learning pr platform that the, the European Handball Federation has and I, I would only uh, give you uh, two um, points or I would emphasize that we think it's very important when we are speaking about e-learning because uh, in the past and also this happens uh, in the European Handball Federation and the other federation, one thing is a repository where I put documents and videos and everyone can go there and take it. And you still can do this in, in many different platforms and also in the European Handball Federation. The other thing is using e-learning because e-learning is a pedagogical process. It's uh, not a repository. You have access to, to many things, but you have someone and this person is like a lecturer uh, in a conference, but he is inside the platform and he, he helps the students with this ongoing process. And you have two ways to doing this. And in my point of view, the best one is asynchronous because this means that if the person, the coach, and as you know, almost all the coaches in, in Portugal and in Europe are not professional. They have another profession and they need education. And through the e-learning process, they, they can have access to, to education, not being there every minute. 
if for the future this is important, we can use a synchronous uh, 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 methodology where in some points the tutor is uh, online and, and through the forums and through the chat he can interact directly with the students. So we believe this was the first step that we are today uh, uh, using and again I say as in many other countries, I remember in Portugal together with Spain our first master coach uh, course education, one of the models was through um, e-learning because maybe at that time the best Spanish coaches were there. They were most professional. Most of them were working outside uh, of Spain, so it was very difficult for them to come to the to the coaching courses. And through this model, it was perfect, and uh, everybody could have access to the education. Being in Romania or being in Czech Republic, I didn't need to go to Valencia or to Lisbon uh, for for this model. Okay, but this is what we are do, what we are doing now in Europe, and, and uh, I think everyone knows this, even in his uh, countries. Okay, so we have two kind of futures. This is what we call the very near future. This is what we are doing now, uh, and I can say well. At the end, if someone is interested in experimenting this, you can come to, to Lars. We br brought the equipment so you can test it and see how it, how it really works. Um, our uh, idea is through uh, the, the, the VR, uh, through the virtual reality, you can really pick the ball, shoot the ball. You have a, a hole like a common hole, so you are playing handball through a, a virtual world and you can do all the in the future you will uh, you will can do all the movements exactly how you were playing handball now it's only a prototype and it's an on ongoing process but it's uh, it's pretty nice and uh, it's working pretty well of course again as i told you before we have here always a preoccupation concerning education so we are not only using these, these four fans, I think this will be great, in the timeout or before the game, that uh, the supporters can go to the hall, pick up the, retro, uh, the VR system and can, uh, can play a handball. And of course, for the show, this is interesting. But for us, it is more important using this for education because this could help in the future the player to see the game in a different way. It could help the coach to see how the, 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 um, the player sees, because with this VR system, it is possible to, to do that. And we believe using this in the education process and during the practice from the players, it can de help developing uh, handball. Yesterday, um, I, I already spoke about this in my communication, but some of you were not uh, what here, uh, is the same idea. It is very great that we can uh, use uh, better video games to promote our sport, our handball, but we truly, truly believe that also through uh, the, the, the video games, through esports, we can have better tools for the, the education process. Again, because it will give the opportunity for the referees, for the coaches to have pers uh, different perspective from the game that even with video or live, uh, you cannot access to all uh, the information or to experiment or to see the details. And this could also help. So in the all uh, what we are doing, we of course, it's for us important, the promotion of our sports, but always uh, education ahead. And finishing, I would also emphasize this. We don't want to transform and say, okay, handball goes away, now we have uh, virtual handball. This is not what we are trying to share with you. What we truly believe is that using the technology we can develop handball better and that through technology our coaches, our referees, our players, our delegates can be better and that our supporters and our fans for handball can have another perspective, another tools to understand better our sport, to, to have contact with everything that has to do with sport. This is our approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pedro. Okay. Thank you, Marina.
All right, how is it without the mic? Um, good for the audience, but not good for you. All right, I take the mic then. All right, uh, hello then. Uh, my name is Grzegorz, and I'm a Polish sports psychologist, uh, educated in Canada and Finland. And um, I'm also certified by the European uh, Federation of Sports Psychology, FEPSAC. And I'm currently working back home in Poland, and I'm very much connected to handball because I am uh, uh, teaching psychological skills and uh, consulting uh, youth female head handball players in one of the elite sports high schools uh, in my hometown, Gliwice. And uh, uh, yeah, I also work in uh, a range of sports, and uh, I was invited today to talk with to you about the wheelchair sports. Uh, and you may wonder why am I the one to talk to you about the wheelchair sports? Well, it is because uh, it is because I have been involved extensively in a sport called wheelchair rugby, and since 2013, I have been uh, a sports psychologist for the national wheelchair rugby team in Poland, uh, and I also have published uh, and promoted a book uh, on. Uh, a, a biography of a very famous uh, wheelchair rugby player. Mark Zupan to wheelchair rugby is like Michael Jordan is to basketball, so he is very, very famous. And I have also done research more on a psychological side on how sports in general and wheelchair rugby in particular can help people with acquired disabilities to adapt uh, and continue on with their uh, with their lives after uh, the accident. And you, in order for you to understand the, leg the language I will be speaking from and how I will connect my experience in wheelchair rugby with handball, uh, I need you to watch a short video on what wheelchair rugby is uh, so you understand where I'm coming from. Invented in 1977 and originally called Murder Ball, wheelchair rugby made its Paralympic debut at Sydney 2000. The sport is played by mixed teams of men and women. Players score goals by carrying a round ball across the opposition's goal line with at least two wheels of their wheelchair on the ground. The field of play is a hardwood court measuring 28 metres by 15 metres. There's an 8 metre goal line at each end, marked by cones. Teams consist of 12 players, with four allowed on the court at any one time. Players all have impairments affecting their arms and legs and are classified using a point system measuring functional physical ability. Each individual is scored from 0.5 up to 3.5. The lower the number, the greater the activity limitation. The four players on the court cannot exceed a total of eight points. For each female player on the court, an additional half point is allowed. Defensive positions are usually played by low point players, whilst attacking players often have higher points. They can be distinguished easily by their wheelchairs. Offensive wheelchairs are shorter, with small bumpers and rounded wings, so they can turn and manoeuvre through tight spaces. Defensive wheelchairs are longer and have a wide bumper in front, designed to strike and hold opposing wheelchairs. Games consist of four eight-minute quarters. If the game is tied at the end of regulation play, three-minute overtime periods are played. Teams have 12 seconds to move the ball from their court into the opposition's half, and 40 seconds to score a goal or they must hand over possession. The player in possession must bounce or pass the ball within 10 seconds of receiving it. To pass the ball, players may throw it, roll it, bat it or bounce it. Kicking the ball is not permitted. This is a full contact sport and clashes between wheelchairs are very much a part of the game. Hitting and blocking is used by both defensive and offensive teams to stop the ball carrier or to create openings for a goal. However, dangerous contact, such as hitting a player from behind, is generally not permitted. Wheelchair rugby is a fast and furious contact sport that makes for spectacular viewing. 
All right, so this is my world, and uh, this is where I'm coming from. Uh, and as you have noticed, the um, wheelchair rugby is uh, not for everybody, uh, because not every person with disability can play the game. A general rule in classification of the players uh, is that they need to have some kind of impairment in at least three out of four limbs. Uh, and based on, based on their functional and medical classification, they are scored from 0.5 to 3.5. Uh, and only eight, eight points can, are allowed on the court, as it was explained in the, in the video. But given that uh, wheelchair rugby is not, um, is not for people with all disabilities, and in fact it was invented for those people who were too weak to play wheelchair basketball, it is, it is a very good question to ask what is disability and how we can accommodate sports for people with disability. And the general definition is that disabil disability is a physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. If we take this uh, definition into account, according to recent European Commission report, in EU we have some 70 million people with disabilities, various disabilities. So there is a, there is a, there is a high chance that in your handball uh, career you will, um, uh, you will meet somebody with some kind of disability. And of course, ever since uh, the 20th century, we have tried to accommodate sports for people with various conditions. And these are the logos or the emblems of three main uh, events for the um, people with disabilities. I wonder if you know any of them. All right, so, so the first one, the first one is the, the most common one uh, in Paralympic Games, and uh, the second most watched sporting event on the planet at the moment. Um, and the second one is Deaflympics. So this is the event for people uh, with hearing uh, dysfunction. And the last one is the Special Olympics. So that is the event for people with all sorts of intellectual disabilities. And I wonder if you uh, have uh, any idea which one of those events is the oldest. All right, so the Paralympics uh, is some say it's as old as the World War II uh, and the first uh, Stoke Madeville Games were um, uh, organized for war uh, veterans in 1948, but it turned into Paralympic Games as we know it today only in 1960, first games in Rome, and the uh, first Winter Games were in Önskuldsvik in Sweden, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, in 1976. Uh, th but the oldest event for people with disabilities is actually Death Olympics, and that is 1926. And so you will never see, or at least uh, uh, according to, to my experience, people with hearing disabilities in the Paralympics. And then we have, of course, Special Olympics, which some say is the last true bastion of, uh, of sport, uh, were initiated in the 60s in Chicago. Uh, the reason why I say it's the last true bastion of sport because I have never heard of a doping case in Special Olympics. I have heard stories where uh, two friends uh, went to the, to the event, one got three medals, the other one got none, and the, the one with three medals shared one with, with her friend. So uh, this, is, this is beautiful, of course. Uh, but then, of course, we are here talking about handball and I guess most of you are passionate about team sports. And so if you look at the Paralympics program, for example, in the coming games in Tokyo, uh, there are five disciplines which I uh, classified as the teams, wheelchair team sports. And one of them is wheelchair rugby, which you have already experienced. The other one, uh, the, the most classic, is wheelchair basketball. Then we have boccia, uh, which is uh, called piton in French. Uh, boccia in Italian, I guess, uh, which is uh, for people with even higher disabilities than, uh, than those who can play wheelchair rugby. And then we have, of course, doubles uh, in racket sports. I don't know if you consider it a team sport, but there is some kind of cooperation necessary. So badminton and tennis. Uh, in terms of winter games, we have wheelchair curling and we have ice sledge hockey. And I, I, when studying in Vancouver, I had a, I had a great uh, pleasure to uh, watch it live and uh, work as a volunteer at the uh, hockey arena where uh, top athletes in this sport played uh, the game. 
Of course, it's not on a wheelchair, it's on a sledge, but it's kind of uh, similar. It would be really weird to have a wheelchair on ice. Uh, and as you, as you can see, most of those disciplines, maybe with exception of wheelchair rugby, which was called murder ball in the beginning, uh, are derived from sports as we know it, right? Basketball is very much basketball, if you look at it. Uh, same with tennis or badminton or even hockey. Uh, so, so this is similar efforts are done in handball, which I will be talking about in a minute. But I, 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 wa I want to have, you, I want to show you a great adaptation example of a sport that we all know for people with varying disabilities, and that is football, because there are four kinds of football for people with disabilities. The first one, still in Paralympic program, is five a side, where you have people with seeing disabilities uh, and uh, of course they play on a smaller court the ball has a, a little ring inside so they know where it is and goalkeepers which is very interesting are uh, are fully abled uh, people so they see everything uh, and still concede goals which is pretty cool i think and then you have a se seven side football uh, which is for people with um, some kind of neurological dysfunctions, such as uh, a cerebral palsy, uh, and it was in the Paralympic program until uh, London 2012. Um, and growing in popularity, amp football. So this is uh, football for people with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, lower li limb dysfunction. Most most of them are amputees, and then uh, goalkeepers. Uh, are typically have typically one of the uh, one of the upper limbs amputated. A very fast-paced sport, and uh, uh, I'm also interested in following it because uh, I know the national team's coach. And in the European Championship, which was played in Turkey last year, I believe, uh, and it was played in the Galatasaray stadi Stadium in uh, Istanbul, it was fully packed. So 40,000 people were watching amputee football final game. And then last, and perhaps hardest to imagine, is power chair football. So how people with, uh, without, uh, without feeling in the, uh, in the lower extremities can play football? Well, on electric chairs. Uh, it's also very fascinating to watch. Uh, I don't have a video here, but if you ever uh, wonder, uh, just uh, go to uh, YouTube and, and, and have a look. Uh, it's also growing in popularity. So given these examples, of course, uh, now we move to what you guys are mostly <laughs> interested in, which is handball. And if you, uh, if you, if you trace the, the efforts of the European Handball Federation to include handball on the map of Paralympic sports, it traces back to 2006, at least this is my uh, personal research, uh, so it's 13 years of effort of bringing it to, to life uh, and uh, developing it so people with different disabilities have an alternative to play a team sport. Most Paralympics disciplines uh, are individual, so there is not a lot of choice uh, to experience team sport environment. If you ever watch a game, it is pretty much like handball. I mean, it's even even the, the court is the same, the goal is the same. Um, they play with ball size two, uh, and um, and uh, even tactical solutions are are very much uh, uh, similar. Uh, well, the only difference is, of course, that they move uh, uh, their bodies on on chairs, not uh, not on legs. Uh, and uh, since 2015. Uh, there is uh, a European Wheelchair Handball Nations tournament, which I believe is uh, is some kind of a um, a prototype of a future European Championships. And uh, there have been uh, a few nations already participating, uh, and uh, uh, there is a tournament coming up in 2019. This year, later in this year, I believe it's in, in, in the middle of December, uh, in Zagreb, Croatia, where there is uh, first time in the final tournament, there are six teams participating. So if you are around that part of Europe, uh, it, uh, it would be definitely very uh, interesting to watch. As any uh, sport for people with disability, wheelchair handball currently experience, 
certain challenges. Uh, and here I uh, attempted to, uh, to summarize them as I see it. And, and first and most pressing challenge is, of course, clarifying a uh, classification system. Uh, so who actually is eligible to play handball and what kind of disabilities are we going to allow to play? Uh, given the definition I provided in the in the beginning of my presentation, I am uh, I am very uh, curious how it's going to develop because, uh, for given wheelchair basketball example, a lot of wheelchair basketball players are actually able to walk, which is sometimes very shocking to spectators when the chair falls down and the player just gets up by himself and, and straps himself back to the chair. The, the most uh, extreme example of a person that I know uh, personally is the playing coach of the Polish national wheelchair basketball team whose only disability is missing the big toe. So he's actually a regular person. And if you met him on a train, you would never guess that he has any kind of disability. So. Uh, and of course, like there, there are uh, 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 there are different guidelines for wheelchair basketball classification system, but the main one I would say is those who can't play regular basketball can play wheelchair basketball. So you all even see like people with permanent uh, uh, knee injuries. Uh, like torn ACLs, there was a lot of uh, uh, talk today about injuries, can sit on a wheelchair and give, the, give themselves a chance to play basketball. How handball is going to resolve it, I'm personally very curious. Then, of course, finding and addressing target audiences is another challenge because on one hand, the uh, market for Paralympic sports and for sports for people with disability is somewhat saturated because there are things that people can choose. A uh, great example is from a uh, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee which sends letters to war veterans after they, during the rehabilitation process with lists of sport disciplines they can participate in uh, after coming back home from, from war. Uh, and so, of course, who are we going to involve is a, is a great question that I'm also curious to find answer. And then last, and I think the, the, the most uh, difficult uh, challenge will be to market and promote the sport, and especially uh, within the Paralympic movement, uh, because working in wheelchair rugby, I can, I can say that ever since its creation in the 70s, uh, it has boomed only once it got included in the Paralympic movement and in the Paralympic program in Atlanta 96. Ever since uh, then, it's been part of the program and the sport is played uh, all over the world uh, and it's uh, growing the, uh, its popularity. Of course, uh, in wheelchair rugby, we probably won't be competing for people with these kind of disabilities that will eventually end up playing wheelchair handball, uh, but still, uh, it is a very important uh, job here to be made. Uh, lastly, I, I would like to uh, end with an inspiring uh, movie which uh, shows uh, uh, footage of athletes uh, preparing for the Sochi Winter Paralympics, which basically shows the, the attitude of, of these men and women who decide uh, to compete in sport uh, despite their physical and sensory disabilities. Have a look. Phone stop. I am not a morning person. I hate early morning. Odbierz. Jadę, jadę, już jestem w drodze. Oh, it's freezing. It's so cold. Nienawidzę deszczu. I'll never get used to this. Headwind is the worst. Bocznym wiatrze nie lubię go. Wrong park. Wrong way. Złe szkła. I will never land this shit. I'm too tired. My whole body hurts. Every muscle hurts. I can't sleep.
But you know what my real problem is? I hate losing. Sport doesn't care. Um, and I'm very, very happy uh, that the EHF and uh, uh, different organizations involved in handball are making efforts to uh, promote the sport and uh, I would be very happy to participate in the process as well. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you want to uh, talk to me, I'll be there for a coffee break or just uh, drop me an email uh, and have a good uh, rest of the conference. Thank you. I do believe so, yeah. Uh, because, pr precisely because there is not a lot of team sports that people with disability can play. Uh, and not everybody likes basketball, not everybody can play wheelchair rugby, um, and other than that, there are no, no, no more choices, pretty much. Uh, that was amp football, amputee football. Yeah, but it's it's really big in Turkey. I think it's it, it's it's not it's not the matter of of the sport itself, but uh, but the place where the tournament took uh, to, took place, right? So Tur the Turks are very very passionate about amputee football. I don't know why, but it's it's really big there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now we have next presenter. Okay, uh, I'm Sergio Arvidal, uh, I'm an at the University. Oh, I need my phone. Yeah, I'm going to go back. I'll start again. I'm Sergio Lara Bercial and I work for Leeds Beckett University in the UK. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about iCoach Kids. Now, before we do that, if the guys that are standing at the back, if you're standing by choice, no problem, carry on standing. If you were trying to be polite, please, by all means, feel free to come forward and sit down. I can give you a 30 second break to sit down if you want. You can stand, that's no problem. Okay. Oh, come on, come and sit down. Yeah, come and join us. Okay. You're very polite in, in humble, okay? Um, I feel like a bit of an outsider because I am a basketball coach. Um, so thank you for welcoming me into the humble, the humble world. Now I'm going to start the session with, um, I'm a researcher, like a lot of you here, okay? So we're going to do some research in the room today. I'm going to do, a, we're going to start with a mini, 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 very microscopic focus group. Can you answer? Oh, this is not working, no problem, we'll stay here. Can you get together with someone, just a person next to you, and answer that question for me? Is a sport good for children? Come on, 30 second focus group for you. Do some work, people. Okay, so would someone like to give me your views on, on that question? Is a sport good for children? Who wants to say something about it? Okay, I'll, I'll come over to you. I, I, I think sport is good for children because they learn so much for their, uh, their life after that. Uh, for the elder people, when they are, um, have injuries and uh, they are more cognitive uh, skills and get more strength and are healthier and it's uh, the moves, uh, maybe the Scandinavians do it, uh, um, movements during um, education, they have more brain uh, capacities and I think it's very very important. Okay, thank you. What's, what's your name? Richard. Richard, thank you, Richard. Okay, um, all right, so it is a bit of an easy question, right? I think if we asked 
a hundred people, a hundred would say yes, a sport is good, for, is good for children. But is it always good for children? Okay, we know there's a lot of research showing that yes, when children do sport, there is all these things that they can get better biologically, their physical, uh, their stamina, their fitness, their endurance, their psychological capacities go up, their social abilities grow. Okay, so there's a case for, for sport and children. But a lot of the times we think that children, um, that sport has this magic power, that as soon as we give a child uh, a handball or a football or a basketball, straight away they're a better person and their life is gonna be better for it. But we know that that's not true. Okay, we know that there's a lot of examples where when sport is not done in the right way, it can be bad for children. Okay, and you've talked about some of that this morning. So sport looks a lot more like this for children, where we have to put the right pieces in, in place for sport to be good for children. Okay, we cannot take it for granted. We cannot think that sport is magically something that is always gonna make make children better people or, or make them happy because we know that that's not true we also know that the sport system currently is set up in this particular way in what we call the pyramid the talent pyramid okay, we know that most federations around the world the way they operate is they want to create a base for the pyramid so get some children playing the sport in this case humble but then we know that only a few continue until we really increase the demands time-wise, psychologically, so we get the ones that make it to the top and play in the World Cup or in the uh, Olympics or in professional sport. And the rest, we don't seem to care that much. Or we haven't cared that much over the years. Okay? And I don't know how that works in, in, in Humble. In my sport, we still have this system where it's, a, it's the talent pyramid. Okay? We don't care how many children drop out as long as we can be, in my case, like Spain, world champions right now. Okay? Wow. We're good. Everything's, everything's fantastic because we're world champions. Is it? Okay. We know that sport can have all those negative consequences. This is well documented in the, uh, in the research. It's not always a, a rosy picture. Now, if you're still in the room, you do not become depressed about youth sport, great, stay with me, okay? We have to accept that we have a bit of a problem with youth sport, okay? Uh, but where do we start? How do we start fixing this problem? Well, that's the first realization that we need to have, that children are not mini adults that even when we get them dressed up in the nice humble clothes or we buy them the, the $150 basketball shoes, they're not, they're not adults, they're still children. And we have to start looking at the sport, the sport in general, through the eyes of the child. So let me play you a little clip um, of my, my eight-year-old son's basketball team, which I don't coach, and I wish I could convince the people that run this league that perhaps this is not the best way to do basketball for eight-year-olds, okay? Watch this for a second. 25 seconds, okay? See what, let, tell me what you see after. <laughs> so what did you see in that clip? Did anybody take a shot? How many children touched that ball? What did the children spend their time doing? Running around, okay? They're not involved, okay? It's five on five, five v five, okay? When you watch these games over 40 minutes, that game, could, that game actually finished 11-5, okay? In 40 minutes, because the children spend most of their time doing this. Because they spend all their time trying to get the ball from one side to the other and losing it somewhere in the middle. Okay? And how, how much fun is that for a child? Actually, they, they, they still kind of enjoy it, which is amazing because children are very resilient, but could we make that a lot more entertaining for the children, okay? So that's one issue, that we tend to, uh, to do sport for children 
in a way that doesn't fit them. But that's another issue that we have, okay? Like bananas, children come in all shapes and in all, uh, all stages of maturation. But the spore system, you can put that on Twitter if you want, okay? <laughs> the spore system is mostly designed for these bananas, okay? We don't care much about these bananas, okay? But also, what we know from the research is that actually a lot of these bananas are the bananas that then go and win Olympic medals. Late maturers are actually some of the best performers. So we need to also make sure that we change sport so all the bananas can play. You can tell that I've been watching the Minions a lot lately. All right, so what's our job? We as coaches or coach developer or sports lecturers or administrators, we are in charge of setting the right environment for children in sport. We have a responsibility to set an environment that caters for all the bananas, not just for the, uh, the good ones, okay? But doing that is not easy. We mentioned it before here, someone said, yeah, but most of the uh, coaches are parents or mums or, or dads that don't know much about sport, okay? That's the reality, we need to accept that reality, okay? And we need to give them that toolbox so they can make sport fit the child. Because at the moment, as you saw in that clip, what we're doing is making the child fit the sport. And that tends not to work in the long term. So is this a mission impossible? I'm glad you're, you're saying no, it's not impossible. I don't think so. It is mission difficult, but it's not impossible. And that's where iCoach Kids comes in. So iCoach Kids is a European and Erasmus Plus funded project where, with the goal of developing uh, a specialist workforce of youth sport coaches, giving as many, as many people as possible the knowledge and understanding they need to do a good job setting the right environment for children in sport. Now, first thing that we did is, okay, we need to understand really what that good environment looks like. What is, what is a good environment for children in sport? So we did a literature review, a really big literature review, that then we summarized into a, a nice 15-page document um, that, that makes really good reading as a starting point to understand what's good for children in sport. And then we actually condensed that uh, literature review into what we call the iCoach Kids Pledge. The 10 golden rules for um, positive experiences in sport for children. Now, we're gonna do a little, another little bit of research here. That took us 18 months to do that job, the, from the literature review to getting the, uh, the 10 golden rules. I'm gonna give you 90 seconds. As you can tell, I'm a very fair person. 90 seconds with the person next to you, identify maybe two or three of those 10 golden rules. What would be your top two or three golden rules to provide positive experiences for children? Okay, ready? 90 seconds, go, 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 go. Write them down with someone. It's a competition, people. You need to work together, okay? Ten seconds. And time. Okay, stop talking now. All right. Now, this is really depressing, okay, because we spent 18 months doing this, and normally in 90 seconds, you are able to come up with most of the rules. So I lost 18 months of my life that I'm never going to get back, but it's okay. All right, so here we go. Rule number one, be child-centered. Did you have it? If you had this rule, you go, yeah, okay? <laughs> and then we're gonna keep a point. So what does that mean? That really every decision we make in sport for children should be based on the needs of the children, not on the needs of the adults or the needs of the coaches, okay? Second, be holistic. As Richard said, in sport, really the sport is just the excuse. What can we do to add value to their life? 
to make them better people, prepare them for life better. Be inclusive, okay? Greg just talk, talked about um, uh, disability sport, a very important thing, but not only disability, gender, okay? Race, religion, everything. Make it fun and safe, okay? Yeah. We have to keep them in the sport. The best thing we can do for children is to make sure they come back the following week. Okay, that's, that's a, as a coach, the only question you should ask yourself every time is, are they going to come back? Okay? And it has to be safe as well. It's not only fun. If it's not safe, they're not coming back either. Now, that's an interesting one. Prioritize the love for sport above learning sport. As coaches, we have a tendency to always want to teach them something and because of that, we sometimes make it really boring. And again, if they don't come back next week, we're never going to have a chance to teach them or for them to learn. So the priority is always that they come back. Fun and learning, they need to go together. Focus on foundational skills. We don't have to make them look like uh, Michael Jordan on day one. Okay, let's really build them up. We talked about injury prevention before. That starts here. Injury prevention starts at this age. It doesn't start when they're already 18. That's too late. Okay, foundational skills, movement skills. Ooh, the parents. Engage the parents positively. Parents are not the enemy. This is not a Darth Vader kind of scenario, okay? And Luke Skywalker. Engage the parents positively. They are the best resource we have. Plan progressive programs. That's all about thinking long term. If you're coaching 10 year olds, what's your job for a 10 year old? Think about what they need to be 10 years from then. What they need to be when they're 20. And your job is, what do they need from me now? How can I plan that progressively? Use different methods to enhance learning. Please, 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 let's avoid having long lines of children waiting for a turn and them going through cones like that's the, uh, the, the be all and end all. Let's, let's let them play, let's teach through games. Let's mix these things up. And finally, use competition in a developmental way. Now, competition is not the devil. Competition is not bad. How we structure it and how we manage it, that's what's bad. Okay? Make competition feed the child. Again, not the child feed the competition. So, when we tell coaches about this, normally, particularly parents, okay, they feel like this. Coaching children feels a little bit like this, because we have to do all of those things. So we're always rushing from one side to another, trying to make sure that none of the plates fall. So that's where ICO Cheats came in, really, to support people understand what they can do to keep all those plates spinning. And we created a website with lots of, uh, there's about 120 different articles and, and, and resources there. Some e-learning as well that I'll show you later. And a YouTube channel with over 120 videos, instructional videos, really for the target population of coaches that work with children. But you might be thinking, Actually, before, before that, let's play another little quick, quick research, okay? Let's play bingo, right? Three minutes. No, not even three minutes. I'm going to give you another 90 seconds. If you were to design e-learning for children's coaches, which topics would you cover? Okay, so again, with the person next to you, write down some of the key topics, some of the key subjects you would, you would use for e-learning for coaches of children. Okay, 90 seconds. Go, 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 go. It's a difficult question, guys, but you are, you are the smartest people in the room. Come on. Think about, write down some key topics. What would be a key topic? Would it be astrophysics? No, right? What would you talk about? What would you try and teach coaches that are going to be working with children? I'm going to put you out of your misery. Okay. So in our MOOCs, in an e-learning, the first course is about developing an effective environment for children. Okay, what does that mean? Understanding your role as a coach. What are you there for? You're not there to win the Champions League. Understanding what a coaching philosophy is and trying to work out what your philosophy is. How to develop a vision for your, for your club, for your program. 
understanding what children get from sport. Okay, this idea of holistic development, how to create a positive climate, a positive pedagogy, and how to safeguard children in sport. So that's course one that we did. Okay. Course two, physical literacy and child-centered coaching. Motivation, how do we keep children motivated in sport? How do we make sport inclusive? How children grow? Do we understand how children develop and therefore what that means for us as coaches? Because it's not the same coaching as a nine-year-old, than a 12-year-old, than a 16-year-old. And general knowledge of motor skill development and strength and conditioning for children. And the final course, coaching on the ground, planning, doing, and reviewing. Planning for success, and clearly defining what success means for children, really, it's not winning. How learning happens, understanding how children learn so we can then coach in a, in, in a, in a good way. Coaching in competition, how can we use competition to maximize development? And the idea of lifelong learning for coaches. How do we support coaches become lifelong learners? So we're always learning. So after 20 years of coaching, you've got 20 years of experience as opposed to having coached the same year 20 times. Okay. So a quick taste of what the videos look like, so you can you can see where we're going with this. Hey coach, welcome back. The previous video looked at the different energy systems and when and how we can develop them. This video We'll look at the implications of how children grow and develop and what we can do to promote strength development. Yes, you heard me right. We will explore the topic of strength development in children and debunk a few myths along the way. While the potential physical and psychosocial advantages of youth sports participation are well known, there are still some misconceptions about the importance of strength development in children. Research has shown a decline in motor skill performance and physical strength across Europe in the last 10 years. Therefore, it is important that coaches understand how strength development can be incorporated into training practices for children. Okay, so what is You get an idea what the videos are about. And you might be thinking, that's gonna cost me a lot of money, okay? Now, all of this, because it was done through an Erasmus uh, Plus grant, is completely free. I coach case is not for profit and completely free. Anyone can use it, either as an individual, as a club, as a federation, it's up to you. It's up there for you. And over time, it will be in all these languages and more. We are constantly signing new agreements with people that want to translate it into their languages. Um, so it will be available in many, many languages. After completing the course, you get a certificate. That's our latest graduate. No, I'm only joking, he hasn't done the course. Um, but it's not accredited as such because it's not, uh, there, is no, um, th there is a test at the end, but it's not face-to-face, -face, so it's just a, a certificate of participation in the course but it is, it is available there. We are now, we've signed partnerships with the Special Olympics, with UEFA, with FIBA, with World Rugby, okay, and, um, and with the International Skating Union. Uh, so it's now becoming a bit of a global movement because it's free and everybody can use it. It's all over the world, okay? So that's it. The last message is really keep looking at the sport through the eyes of the kids. And if you want to know more about iCoach Kids, come and grab me with a cup of coffee. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no.